everybody and welcome to the sixth session of The Hobbit. We are going to read two entire chapters today. But before that, uh, <laughs> in this video, we are going to summarize or read the summaries of chapters 14 and 15 that we read last week and have a little kahoot with uh, some vocabulary. Uh, so welcome everybody and I'm going to share my screen so we can start reading. So as usual, we we are using the summaries from the Center for Fantasy Oxford that had a readathon in April, May, May this year. So we, we follow them for summaries. So we have chapter 14 here, and I will need a, a volunteer, a volunteer to read this. I can. Yeah, sure. Start. Go, Omar. In chapter 14, we lead Bilbo and the dwarves and go to Esgarot. The lake people see golden light in the distance and think at first that is the king mended the mountain, but it's smog, flying quickly and bent on destruction. The lake people destroy the bridge to their island, gather water and call up their warriors. Smoke made numerous pass over the town, each time destroying buildings with fire and his tail. The men sent arrows up in the sky to try to bring him down, but nothing stopped him. While most flee the almost destroyed town by a, by a boat, Bar, a descent of Girion, Lord of Dale, keeps shooting. He's down to his last arrow when a trash lands on his shoulder and tell, and tell him about Smog weak, weak spot. With his last arrow, bars fell Smog, who falls on the, on the burning town and perishes. While Smog is now dead, the people are stranded in the cold with no here to live and little food. These circumstances, a ver. Mm. from criticism of the master and calls for Var, now Var the dragon shooter, to be king. But the master is wily and, wily and tries to shift blame to the dwarves. While Var refutes him, this discussion prompts talks of the treasure among the people, including Var. Smog is dead, but we sense that there is more conflict to come, as news of the unguard treasures spreads. We end the, chap the chapter with the elves arriving five days later to help the people of Esgarot with food and other goods. The elves were all origi originally headed towards the lonely mountain, expecting war over the treasure, but they diverged course as the ele elven king had pity and went to the lake to help the people recover. Thank you very much. It was a long summary, but a summary in the a very detailed summary of chapter 14 that we read here. Thank you. And finally, chapter 15, it's actually a, a short summary. Somebody? Someone? Anyone? Anybody? Okay. Who was that? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Anna Yaku. I don't know how to pronounce that yet. Okay, in this chapter, the, the dwarves learn from the old raven rock that the small is dead, killed by, by Bart, and the elves are coming to demand a share of small treasure. The dwarves Rejoice, rejoice about the smoke death, but are angered by this other news. Thorin disregards the raven's advice that he should share his treasure with the, with both the elves and the men of the lake town. Instead, they send for a dime to come and join them in protecting the treasure for these thieves. They barricade themselves inside a lonely mountain 
and when when Bart comes to parley with Thorin, Thorin dis dismisses him as a dragon sickness is starting to overcome him. Bart then decides to besiege the mountain and let the dwarf stare, stare to death or choke on the gold. Thank you very much. And this will be where we finished. And now we are going to go to our hoot. Let's go. Or come. I'm already here. Okay. What did I do? I don't know what I did. I wanted to unmute. Thank you. We have Bart, Miguel, Chad, Nan. Who is Nan? Help me out here. HD, Hector. Lovely, lovely avatar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chad, that's more like you. It's got your, your skin color. <laughs> Who's Nan? Can you tell me? Uh, I am Nan. Ah, oh, you're Nan. Why are you Nan now? Norway, I know you No, my goodness. All right then. Uh, okay, so Omar, Rose. Can't connect. Change my laptop and can't connect. You can't? I can't. On the phone? Maybe. I try. Sure, try. Rose? Come, Rose. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, don't worry, Rose. I feel one person is missing. <laughs> I think it's just one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I got it. Okay, Omar's coming from the phone. Oh my god, we have a new friend. <laughs> it's a sky. I'm sending the link here so you can come to the hood. I, I was thinking, I was thinking nobody's gonna come from the States because they don't speak Spanish. And, uh, uh, but this is not Spanish, this is English. Uh, I am all messed up. Bart, you are Fernando. I'm sure people from the UK wouldn't agree that I speak English either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I doubt also when when I hear talking speaking and what what would he say? Yeah. Uh, hi Scott, you there? You coming? You know Hello. how to Kahoot? How's it going? Great. Scott, click the link in the chat to join the Kahoot. Okay, gotcha. I didn't see that. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Okay, let's do it. Was that a dancing bear? A 
Of course. Of course it was. So we're getting close to the end. We will review some words that we're reading, that we read in the summaries, and that we will read today. Just a few. We have read about birds. Which of these is not a bird? A thrush, a raven, a crow, a carrion. You have to answer in your device, not on my screen. You have 10 seconds. We have seen all of these words, by the way. Very good. A carrion is not a bird, but there's a kind of bird that is a carrion bird. Uh, a thrush is a bird. It's actually the bird that, that told Bart <laughs> about, uh, about Smaug's uh, weak spot. Uh, carrion birds are these birds that eat, you know, deceased dead animals. And then the crows and the ravens that we're going to um, learn about uh, uh, next. Carry on, my friend. <laughs> so talking about those birds, this is one of those. What is it? Is it a crow, a thrush, a carrion bird, or a raven? I think I gave it too much time. Okay, Rose is answering here in the chat. I'm not gonna tell your answer because people can copy, you know. Oh no, but they will read. <laughs> they will read anyway. Make up your mind. You have 20 seconds for a final answer. Crow, thrush, carry on bird, raven. No googling. So that's a thrush. I have no idea what what animal it is. I mean, in Spanish, uh, I just googled it, and apparently it's a bird that is all around the world. So they change a little. So I looked for British thrush, just in case talking would, you know, be familiar with something. <laughs> okay, Rose, don't worry, don't worry. Yes, it was a thrush. Good. 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 Very good. Ravens now, are much bigger, and they no, are much shaggy. They're and they're ravens and crows. Also, so, ravens are famous for their deep croaky voice. What happened? I crows have told you to stop. Okay. Your crow definitely made a noise. Also, crows are seen in larger groups, while ravens tend to travel in pairs. I don't know what it is. Well, this is just a, a short explanation between ravens and crows because they are they they look alike, like a lot. <laughs> Ravens are much bigger and they have much shaggier feathers on their throats. Also, ravens are famous for their deep croaky <coughs> noise, while crows have the more typical <coughs> noise. Your crow definitely made a <coughs> noise. Also, crows are seen in larger groups, while ravens tend to travel in pairs. On average, crows have a lifespan of around seven to eight years in the wild, while ravens can live between 10 and 15 years. Did I ask for a list of comprehensive differences between ravens and crows? Well, I suppose you're going to tell me now that it's tails wrong or something else silly. Well, actually... Oh, for heaven's sake. Ravens have wedge-shaped tails when they fly, but crows have fan-shaped. Different shaped tails? I don't buy it. It's true. There's lots of birds that are all black that belong to the Corvus genus. Crows, ravens, jackdaws and rooks. Okay, so ravens and crows are very similar, so everybody can mistake them. Mistaken them. All right, so true or false? This is Roak the Raven. Is that how you pronounce it? I suppose. A Roak, or I don't know. Yeah, it is. It is Roak the, the Raven. Yeah. 
Oh, good job, Scott. <laughs> so there will be other animals that will appear when we read, which will not appear. Eagles, locusts, bats, or wolves. Well, I put the pictures here, but now I think they are in a different order. Eagle, locusts, bats, wolves. Which will not appear. Aha, uh -huh. very good. They won't appear, but they will be mentioned. All right. <laughs> locusts, locusts, I guess. I don't know. Very good, Scott. Never mind your your native speaker of English and uh, I'm a Tolkien fan. <laughs> now we're gonna see this word a lot today. Besieged. That I really had trouble learning when I was reading the Lord of the Rings, and so I wanted to put it here. What is the meaning of besieged? Surrounding and attacking a fortified place to isolate it from help. Surrounded by enemy forces and cut off from health or supplies? Does it mean in addition? Or does it mean a peaceful place? I kind of like that word. Oh, Rose, I hadn't read your, your, your previous answer. No, no, no. Besieged means that the place is surrounded by enemy forces and cut off from help or supplies. Uh, but the ones that are, you know, attacking, they are uh, laying a siege, right? They are sieging, let's say, in inactive. The passive, the one getting attacked is the one besieged. <laughs> okay. Besieging, besieging. Thank you very much. So, uh, Chet and Scott were fighting over it, the first fight. <laughs> now, we're going to read about dwarves. Which of these do dwarves not wear or carry? I mean, when, when we read today. I didn't put the names here because I, I couldn't do it, but... Um, this is, you know, uh, and, and I also have my my notes here because they, they are not easy words. <laughs> Let me tell you. Uh, uh, this is a hauberk of, you know, mail, chain mail. This, are, this is a matak. Uh, this is also the mail, but, you know, a mesh that can be around the body. And this is a, um, a, a casket where you put something valuable. These are the words that we're going to see, which they do not wear and carry. <laughs> All of them, but they do not carry the casket. Somebody else will. Okay. okay. Oh, oh, well, well, there's been a change. <laughs> and the string hands. <laughs> so, is this true for you or, or false? There's no wrong answer. Yeah, there is a wrong answer because you have to be red. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. And our podium is <laughs> the teddy bear's cat. Omar, second place. Very good. And first, who would it be? Oh, a little brain chat. <laughs> Thank you. And then we had Nan and HD as fourth and fifth place. Good. Oh my good. Okay. Let's read. Something happened with my archive.org and my previous copy did I couldn't borrow it anymore. So I'm borrowing this one. It's not that bad. So we'll read from here or from the book you have. English, Spanish, you choose it, uh, but uh, please write your name in the chat so I have a list and I can call you out, please. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Bart, you weren't in the list. 
I'm gonna make one especially for you to win. Don't worry. You have next week. Write your name in the chat, please. If you wanna read. I suppose all of you. <laughs> Y'all just tell me what part to read and I'll read whatever part nobody else wants to read. Just write your name. I'll call you. Well, I want to like let everybody else pick their spot, and then I'll read whatever else there is. Jesus Christ! <laughs> Who is next week? <laughs> <laughs> I will read, but it will be better for us. I think I uh, about others. I think, but I will if you ask me to. I will ask both of you. Yeah, just okay. tell me when to read, and I'll read it. All right, cool. Hector. Omar, we're gonna read in English. Omar, nobody else is gonna read. Uh, come on, Bart. Don't be shy. Uh, Aina Yako. Okay. <clears throat> you gonna read? Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, wait! Not, not just yet. I'm just making a list. How if yeah. we can tell that you never come? Oh, wait, wait! I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the recording so somebody can edit it later. Uh, so to to stop recording. So otherwise we get too too long a video, or not. Now I'll keep recording and we'll do it at the end, or not, yeah. or yes, or I don't know. What do we do? If you stop it and start it back again, doesn't it just make another, like, doesn't it just add to the end? I think it does. Ah, I think you're right. I think it makes one video, no matter if you stop it and start it again or not. Yeah, yeah. or you can also pause yeah. it. And, uh, you're recording, right? Uh, I need Guarda Narwell. Narwell done. Help but me if, out. If, if we forgot to. Okay, yeah, leave it, leave it running. Okay. Uh, Fernando. There. Was Manuel here? I think I saw him. What happened? Okay, nobody else. I hope y'all saw me uh, spill tea on myself just now. Okay. Don't worry. Who did what? I said, I hope y'all saw me spill tea on myself just now. I had the uh, the ice slap me in the face and the tea went all over my face. Is it sweet tea? Oh, yeah. So it's going to be good and sticky. <laughs> I wash my face more often this week than I usually do. I usually just wash it on Sunday. <laughs> really? <laughs> Whether it needs it or not. That's right. That's right. We're in the mid, almost That's in the right. middle of the week. My, right. bi, my biannual bath. <laughs> <laughs> so as we usually do, more or less half a page each, but I'll, I'll show you with the with, with this little hand. Let's go. Uh, Hector. Okay. Should I start? Please. A thief in the night. Now the days pass slowly and well. Many of the dwarves spend their time piling and ordering the treasure, and now Thorin spoke of the Arkham Stone of Frame, and bade them eagerly to look for it in every corner. For the Arkham Stone of my father, he said, is worth more than a river of gold in itself. And to me, it is beyond price. That stone of all the treasure I name unto myself, and I will be, and I will be avenged on anyone who finds it and withholds it. Bilbo heard the words and he grew afraid, wondering what would happen if the stone was found wrapped in an old bundle of tattered oddments that he used as a pillow. All the same, he did not speak of it. 
for as the weariness of the days grew heavy, the beginnings of a plan had come into his little head. Things had gone on like this for some time, when the ravens brought news that dying and more than 500 dwarfs hurrying from the Iron Hills were now within about two days' march of Dale, coming from the northeast. Thanks. Omar? But they cannot, they cannot reach the mountain and mark, say rock. And I fear least there be battle in the valley. I do not call this concert good. So they are a green folk. They are not likely to overcome the host that beset you. And even if they did so, what will you gain? Winter and snow is hastening behind them. How shall you be fit? without the friendship and goodwill of the lands about you. The treasure is likely to be your debt. So the dragon is no more. But Thorin was not moved. Winter and snow will bite both men and elves, he said, and they may find their dwelling in the west rivers to bear with my friends behind them and winter upon them. They will perhaps be in softer mood to parley with. That night, Bilbo made up his mind. The sky was black and moonless. As soon as it was full dark, he went to a corner of an inner chamber just within the gate and drew from his bundle of rope and also the arcane stone wrapped in the rug. Then he climbed to the top of the wall. Only Bombur was there, for it was his turn to watch, and the dwarves keep only one watchman at a time. Thank you. I Naiko. Okay. It is mighty cold, say Bombur. I wish we could have a fire up here as they have in the camp. It is warm enough inside, say Bilbo. I dare say, but I am bound here till my midnight, grumbled the fat word. A sorry business altogether, not that I venture to disagree with Thorin. May his beard grow ever longer yet. He who was ever a dwarf with a, stick, a stiff neck. Not as stiff as my legs, say Bilbo. I'm tired of stairs and stones passage. I could give a good deal for the feel of gra grass at my toes. I could give a good deal for a feel of a strong drink in my throat and for a soft bed after a good Super. I can't give you those while the siege is going on, but it is long since I watched, and I will take your turn for okay. good. If you like, there is no sleep in, in me tonight. You're a good fellow, Mr. Baggins, and I will take your offer kindly. If there should be anything to note, bruise me first. Mind you, I will lie in the inner chamber to the left, not far away. Off you go, say Bilbo. I will wake you at midnight and you can wake the next watchman. Thank you. As soon as Bombur had gone, Bilbo put on his ring, fastened his rope, slipped down over the wall, and was gone. He had about five hours before him. Bumble would sleep. He could sleep at any time. And ever since the adventure in the forest, he was always trying to recapture the beautiful dreams he had then. And all the others were busy with Thorin. It was unlikely that any, even Philly or Killy, would come out on the wall until it was their turn. It was very dark, 
on the road after a while. When he left, the newly made path and climbed down towards the lower course of the stream was strange to him. At last he came to the bend where he had to cross the water if he was to make for the camp as he wished. The bed of the stream was there shallow but already broad and fording it in the dark was not easy for the little habit. He was nearly across when he missed his footing on a round stone and fell into the cold water with a splash. He had barely scrambled out on the far bank, shivering and spluttering, when up came elves in the gloom with bright lanterns and searched for the cause of the noise. Chad. I was following along in Spanish as well as I could. Okay, here we go. That was no fish, one said. There is a spy about. Hide your lights. They will help him more than us. If it is that queer little creature that is said to be their servant. Servant indeed, snorted Bill Bow. And in the middle of his snort, he sneezed loudly and the elves immediately gathered towards the sound. Let's have a light, he said. I am here if you want me. And he slipped off his ring and popped from behind a rock. They seized him quickly in spite of their surprise. Who are you? Are you the dwarves hobbit? What are you doing? How did you get so far past our sentinels? They asked one after another. I am Mr. Bilbo Baggins, he answered, companion of Thorin, if you want to know. I know your king well by sight, though perhaps he doesn't know me to look at. But Bard will remember me, and it is Bard I particularly want to see. Indeed, said they, and what may be your business? Whatever it is, it's my own, my good elves. But if you wish ever to get back to your own woods from this cold, cheerless place, he answered, shivering, you will take me along quick to a fire where I can dry, and then you will let me speak to your chiefs as quick as may be. I have only an hour or two to spare. Thank you. Scott. That is how it came about that some two hours after his escape from the gate, Bilbo was sitting beside a warm fire in front of a large tent, and there sat too, gazing curiously at him, both the elven king and bard. A hobbit in elvish armor, partly wrapped in an old blanket, was something new to them. Really, you know, Bilbo was saying in his best business manner, things are impossible. Personally, I am tired of the whole affair. I wish I was back in the West in my own home where folk are more reasonable. But I have an interest in this matter, one fourteenth share to be precise, according to a letter which fortunately I believe I have kept. He drew from a pocket in his old jacket, which he still wore over his mail, crumpled and much folded Thorin's letter that had been put under the clock on his mantelpiece in May. A share of the profits, mind you, he went on. I am aware of that. Personally, I am only too ready to consider all your claims carefully and deduct what is right from the total before putting in my own claim. However, you don't know Thorin Oakenshield as well as I do now. I assure you he is quite ready to sit on a heap of gold and starve as long as you sit here. Thank you very much. Hector. Well, let him, said Bart. Such a fool deserves to starve. Quite so, said Bilbo. I see your point of view. At the same time, winter is coming on fast. Before long, you will be having a snow and what not, and supplies will be difficult. Even for elves, I imagine. Also, there will be other difficulties. You have not heard of Dane and the dwarf of the Iron Hills? We had a long time ago. <clears throat> But what has he got to do with us? asked the king. I thought as much. I see I have some information you have not got. Dane, I must tell you, is now less than two days. March off, and has at least 500 green dwarfs with him. A good many of them have had experience in the dreadful dwarf and goblin wars of which you have no doubt heard. When they arrive, there, there may be serious trouble. 
Why do you tell us this? Are you betraying your friends or are you threatening us? Asks Bart grimly. My dear Bart, squeaked Bilbo, don't be so hasty. I never met such suspicious folk. I am merely trying to avoid trouble for all concerned. Now I will make you an offer. Let us hear it, they say. Thank you, Omar. You may see it, say he. It, it, it is this, and he drew forth the Arkenstone and threw away the wrapping. The Elven King himself, whose eyes were used to things of wonder and beauty, stood, stood up in amazement. Even Bar gazed marvel, marveling at, at it in silence. It was as if a glow had been filled with online and home before then in a net woo wooing of the glint of frosty stars. This is this is the Arkenstone of Strain, say Vigo, the hair of the mountain, and it is also the hair of Thorin. He value it above a river of gold. I give it to you. It will aid you in your bargaining. Then mm, Bilbo, not without a shudder, not without a glance of logging, handed the marvelous stone to bar, and he held it in his hand and, and took the it. But how but how is it yours to give? He asked at last with an effort. Oh well, say the hobbit uncomfortably. It isn't exactly bad. Well, I am willing to let it stand against all my claim. Don't you know? I may be a burglar, a burglar, or so they say. Personally, I need really feel like one, but I am an honest one. I hope, more or less. Anyway, I am going back now, and the dwarves can do what they like to me. I hope you will find it useful. Thanks, Ainaiko. 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 Ah, so I just misspelled it. Sorry. Okay. The, the Elven King looked at Bilbo with a new wonder. Bilbo Baggins, he said. You are more worthy to wear the armor of the Elf Princess than many that have looked more comely in it. But I wonder if Thorin. Oh, I can shell will see it so. I have more knowledge of words in general than you have, perhaps. I advise you to remain with us, and here you shall be honored and three welcome. Thank you very much. I am sure, say Bilbo, with a bow. But I don't think I ought to leave my friends like this after as we have gone through together. And I promised promise to walk all to wake old Bombo at midnight too. Really I must be going and quickly. Nothing they could say would stop him, so an escort was provided for him, and as he went both the king and Bart salute saluted him with honor. As they passed through the camp, an, an old man wrapped in a dark cloak rose from a tent door where he, he was sitting and came towards them. Well done, Mr. Baggins, he said, clapping, clapping Bilbo on the back. There is always more about, the, more about you than anyone expects. It was, it was Gandalf. For the first time for many a day, Bilbo was really delighted. But there was no time for all the questions that he immediately wished to ask. Thank you. All in good time, said Gandalf. Things are drawing towards the end now, unless I am mistaken. There is an unpleasant time just in front of you. But keep your heart up. You may come through all right. There's news brewing that even the ravens have not heard. Good night. Puzzled, but cheered, Bilbo hurried on. He was guided to a safe board 
and set a cross dry. And then he said farewell to the elves and climbed carefully back towards the gate. Great weariness began to come over him, but it was well before midnight when he clambered up the rope again. It was still where he had let it, left it. He untied it and hid it. And then he sat down on the wall and wondered anxiously what would happen next. At midnight, he woke up bumbled and then in turn rolled himself up in, the in his corner without listening to the old dwarf's thanks, which he felt he had hardly earned. He was soon fast asleep, forgetting all his worries till the morning. As a matter of fact, he was dreaming of eggs and bacon. The end of the chapter. <laughs> and I was going to use that phrase for a, a, a joke by Tolkien. <laughs> okay, chapter 13. Chat, would you help us starting? So first of all, Escudo de Roble is Oak and Shield. Yeah. So yeah. Es Escudo is Shield, and I guess Roble mm -hmm. is Oak. Right, like the oak tree. Okay. That's correct. Okay, that's pretty cool. Okay. All right, here we go. The clouds burst. Next day, the trumpets rang early in the camp. Soon, a single runner was seen hurrying along the narrow path. At a distance, he stood and hailed them, asking whether Thorin would now listen to another embassy since new tidings had come to hand and matters were changed. That will be Dan, said Thorin when he heard. They will have got wind of his coming. I thought that would alter their mood. Bid them come few in number and weaponless, and I will hear, he called to the messenger. About midday, the banners of the forest and the lake were seen to be borne forth again. A company of twenty was approaching. At the beginning of the narrow way, they laid aside sword and spear and came on towards the gate. Wondering, the dwarfs saw that among them were both Bard and the elven king, before whom an old man wrapped in cloak and hood bore a strong casket of iron-bound wood. Hail Thorin, said Bard. Are you still of the same mind? My mind does not change with the rising and setting of a few suns, answered Thorin. Did you come to ask me idle questions? Still the elf host has not departed as I bade. Till then you come in vain to bargain with me. Is there nothing, is there then nothing for which you would yield any of your gold? Nothing you. that you were to that question. <laughs> okay. You want me to keep going or are you giving it to somebody else? Scott. Okay. You said Scott? Yeah, I did. Okay. He just read, is there then nothing, right? Okay. Yeah. Nothing that you or your friends have to offer. What? Of the ark and stone of Thrain, said he, and at the same moment the old man opened the casket and held aloft the jewel. The light leapt from his hand, bright and white in the morning. Then Thorin was stricken dumb with amazement and confusion. No one spoke for a long while. Thorin at la length broke the silence, and his voice was thick with wrath. That stone was my father's and is mine, he said. Why should I purchase my own? But wonder overcame him, and he added, But how came you by the heirloom of my house? If there is need to ask such a question of thieves. We are not thieves, Bard answered. Your own we will give back in return for our own. How came you by it, shouted Thorin in a gathering rage. I gave it to them, squeaked Bilbo, who was peering over the wall, by now in a dreadful fright. You, you, cried Thorin, turning upon him and grasping him with both hands. You miserable hobbit, you undersized burglar, he shouted at a loss for words, and he shook poor Bilbo like a rabbit. By the beard of Durin, I wish I had Gandalf here. Curse him for his choice of you. May his beard wither. As for you, I will throw you to the rocks. He cried and lifted Bilbo in his arms. Thank you, Hector. It's getting exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Stay, you wish is grand, said a voice. 
the old man with the casket. Oh. Right. The, it was here. Okay. Start. The old man with the casket threw aside his hood and cloak. It is Gandalf, and no one to whom it seems. Unknown to whom it seems. If you don't like my burglar, please don't damage him. Put him down and listen first to what they what he has to say. You all seem in league, said Thorin, dropping Bilbo on the top of the wall. Never again will I have dealings with any wizard or his friends. What have you to say, your descendant of rats? Dear me, dear me, said Bilbo. I'm sure this is all very uncomfortable. You may remember saying that I might choose my own 14th chair. Perhaps I took, I took it too literally. I have been told that dwarves are sometimes politer in word than in deed. The time was all the same when you seemed to think that I have been on some of some service. The standard of rats, indeed. If this is this all the service of you and your family that I was promi promised, Florin, take it that I have disposed of my share as I wish, and let it go at that. I will, said Thorin grimly, and I will let you go at that, and may we never meet again. Then he turned and spoke over the wall. I am betrayed, he said. It was rightly guessed that I could not forbear to redeem the Arkenstone, the treasure of my house. For it, I will give one fourteen share of the hoard in silver and gold setting aside the gems, but that shall be account the promised share of this traitor, and with that reward he shall depart, and you can divide as you will. He will get little enough, I doubt not. Take him, if you wish him to live, and no friendship of mine goes with him. Thank you, Omar. Okay. Get down now to your friends, he said to Bilbo or I will throw you down. What about the gold and silver, asked Bilbo. That shall follow after, follow after as can be arranged, say he. Get down. Until then, we keep the stone, cried Bart. You are not making a very splendid figure as king under the mountain, say Gandalf. But things may change yet. They may indeed, say to me, and already so strong was they. We will demand of the treasure upon him. He was pondering whether by the help of Dane he might not recapture the Arkenstone and withhold the share of the reward. And so Vivo was swung down from the wall and departed with nothing for all his trouble, except the armor which Thorin has given him already. More than one of the dwarves in their hairs felt shame and pity at his going. Farewell, he cried to them. We may meet again as friends. Be off, called Thorin. You have made up with you, which was made by my folk, and is too good for you. It cannot be pierced by arrows. But if you do not hasten, I will sting your miserable feet, so be swift. Uh, not so hasty, say Bart. We, we, we will give you until tomorrow. At noon, we will return and see if you have brought from the horde the portion that is to be set against the stone. If that is done without this deceit, deceit then we will depart and the elf host will go back to the forest in the in the meanwhile farewell with that they went back to the camp but thorin sent messengers by rock telling dying of what had passed passed and bidding him come with war speed that day passed and the night. The next day the wind shifted west, and the air was dark 
and gloomy. The morning was still early when a cry was heard in the camp. Runners came in to report that a, a host of wars had appeared round the eastern spur of the mountain and was now hast hastening to the Then had come. He had hurried, hurried on through the night and so had come open them sooner than they had expected. Each one of his folk was clad in a hauberk of steel mail that hung to his knees, and his legs were covered with a with holes of a fine and flexible and flexible metal mesh. The secret of whose making was possessed by Danes people. The dwarves are excellently strong for their height. But most of these were strong even for wolves. In the battle, they wielded he heavy two hundred mat matoks, but each of them had also a short broad sword on his side and a round shield slung at his back. Their beards were forked and plated and thrust into their belts. Their caps were of iron and they were shot with iron and their face were green. Thanks. Trumpets called men and elves to arms. Before long the doors could be seen coming up the valley at a great pace. They halted between the river and the eastern spur, but a few held on their way and crossing the river drew near the camp. And there they laid down their weapons and held up their hands in sign of peace. Bart went out to meet them, and with him went Bilbo. We are sent from Thine, son of Nine. They said when questioned, We are hastening to our kinsmen in the mountain, since we learned that the kingdom of all is renewed. But who are you? that sit in the plain as foes before defended walls? This, of course, in the polite and rather old-fashioned language of such occasions, meant simply, you have no business here. We're going on, so may we, or we, shall fight you. They meant to push on between the mountain and the loop of the river, for the narrow land there did not seem to be strongly guarded. Bard, of course, refused to allow the dwarves to go straight on to the mountain. He was determined to wait until the gold and silver had been brought out in exchange for the Arkenstone, for he did not believe that this would be done if once the fortress was manned with so large and warlike a company. They had brought with them a great store of supplies, for the dwarves can carry very heavy burdens, and nearly all of Dan's folk, in spite of their rapid march, bore huge packs on their backs in addition to their weapons. They would stand a siege for weeks, and by that time yet more dwarves might come, and yet more, for Thorin had many relatives. Also, they would be able to reopen and guard some other gate, so that the besiegers would have to encircle the whole mountain, and for that they had not sufficient numbers. These were, in fact, precisely their plans, for the raven messengers had been busy between Thorin and Dayan, but for the moment the way was barred, so after angry words the dwarf messengers retired muttering in their beards. Bard then sent messengers at once to the gate, but they found no gold or payment. Arrows came forth as soon as they were within shot, and they hastened back in dismay. In the camp all was now astir, as if for battle, for the dwarves of Dayan were advancing along the eastern bank. Fools! Stop. Stop. Okay. <laughs> Go, Scott. Fools, laughed Bard, to come thus beneath the mountain's arm. They do not understand war above ground, whatever they may know of battle in the mines. 
There are many of our archers and spearmen now hidden in the rocks upon their right flank. Dwarf mail may be good, but they will soon be hard put to it. Let us set on them now from both sides before they are fully rested. But the elven king said, Long will I tarry here, ere I begin this war for gold. The dwarves cannot pass us unless we will or do anything that we cannot mark. Let us hope still for something that will bring reconciliation. Our advantage in numbers will be enough, if in the end it must come to unhappy blows. But he reckoned without the dwarves. The knowledge that the Arican stone was in the hands of the besiegers burned in their thoughts. Also, they guessed the hesitation of Bard and his friends and resolved to strike while they debated. Suddenly, Without a signal, they sprang silently forward to attack. Bows twanged and arrows whistled. Battle was about to be joined. Still more suddenly, a darkness came on with dreadful swiftness. A black cloud hurried over the sky. Winter, thunder, on a wild wind rolled roaring up and rumbled in the mountain. And lightning lit its peak. And beneath the thunder... Another blackness could be seen whirling forward, but it did not come with the wind. It came from the north, like a vast cloud of birds, so dense that no light could be seen between their wings. Thank you. Hector. Halt, cried Gandalf, who appeared suddenly, and stood alone with arms uplift between the advancing dwarf and the ranks awaiting them. Halt, he called in a voice like thunder, and his staff blazed forth with a flash like the lightning. Dread has come upon you all. Alas, it has come more swiftly than guess. Than guess. The goblins are upon you. Bolg of the north is coming. O oh, thine, whose father you sleep, you slew in Moria. Behold, the bats are above his army like a sea of locusts. They ride upon walls and wards are in their train. Amazement and confusion fell upon them all. Even as Gandalf has been speaking, the darkness grew. The dwarves halt and gazed at the sky. <clears throat> the elves cry out with many voices. Come, called Gandalf. There is yet time for counsel. Let Dane, son of Nain, come, with, come swiftly to us. Okay, thank you. Until there, Omar. Okay, so we got a battle that no, that no had expected, and it was called the Battle of Five Armies, and it was very terrible. Upon one side were the goblins and the wild wolf, and upon the other were elves and men and dwarves. This is how it, it fell out. Ever since the fall of the great goblin of the mighty mountain, the hatred of the race for the dwarves has been very kindly to fury. Messengers had passed to and fro between all their cities, colonies, and strongholds, for they resolved now to win the dominion of the north. Tidings they had gathered in secret ways, and in all mountains there was a forging and an army. Then they marched and gathered by hill and valley, going ever by tunnel or under dark, until around and beneath the great mountain, Gundabad of the Gundabad of the north, where was their capital. A vast host was assembled, ready to sweep down in time of storms when the words opened the south. Then they learned of the death of the smoke and joy was in their hearts, and they hastened night after night through the mountains, and, and came thus at last on a sudden from the north, heard of the hills of Dane. Not even the ravens knew of their coming until they came out in the broken lands which divided the lonely mountain from the hills behind. How much Gandalf knew cannot be said, but it is plain that he had not expected this sudden assault. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Um, this is the plan that he made 
in council with the Elfen King and with Bard and with Dine, for the warlord now joined them. The goblins were the foes of, of all, and at their coming all other quarrels were forgotten. Their only hope was to lure the goblins into the valley between the arms of the mountain, and themselves, themselves to man the great spurs that struck south and east. Yet this would be perilous. If the goblin were in insufficient numbers to overrun the mountains itself, and so attack them also from behind and above. But there was no time to make any other plan or to summon any help. Soon the thunder passed rolling away to the southeast, but the bad cloud came flying lower over the shoulder of the mountain and whirled, whirled about them, shooting out the light and filling them with dread. To the mountain, called Bar, to the mountain, let us take our places while there is yet time. On the southern spur, in its lower slopes and in the rocks at its feet, the elves were set. On the eastern spur were men and dwarves. But Bard and some of the nimblest of men and elves climbed to the height of the eastern shoulder to gain a view to the north. Soon they could see the lands before the mountain's feet black with a hurrying multitude. Erlong the vanguard swirled round the spur's end and came rushing into Dale. These were the swiftest wolf riders, and already their cries and howls rent the, far, the air afar. A few brave men were strong before them to make a feint of resistance, and many there fell before the rest drew back and fled to, to either side. As Gandalf had hoped, the goblin army had gathered behind the resisted vanguard and poured now in rage into the valley, driving widely up between the arms of the mountain, seeking for the foe. Their banners were countless, black and red, and they came on like a tide in fury and disorder. Yeah. It was a terrible battle, the most dreadful of all of Bilbo's experiences, and the one which at the time he hated most which is to say it was the one he was most proud of and most fond of recalling long afterwards, although he was quite unimportant in it. Actually, I may say he put on his ring early in the business and vanished from sight, if not from all danger. A magic ring of that sort is not a complete protection in a goblin charge, nor does it stop flying arrows and wild spears, but it does help in getting out of the way, and it prevents your head from being specially chosen for a sweeping stroke by a goblin swordsman. The elves were the first to charge. Their hatred for the goblins is cold and bitter. Their spears and swords shone in the gloom with a gleam of chill flame. So deadly was the wrath of the hands that held them. As soon as the host of their enemies was dense in the valley, they sent against it a shower of arrows, and each flickered as it fled as if with stinging fire. Behind the arrows, a thousand of their spearmen leapt down and charged. The yells were deafening. The rocks were stained black with goblin blood. Just as the goblins were recovering from the onslaught and the elf charge was halted, there rose from across the valley a deep-throated roar. With cries of Moria and Dan, Dan, the dwarves of the Iron Hills plunged in, wielding their mattocks upon the other side, and beside them came the men of the lake with long swords. Panic came upon the goblins, and even as they turned to meet this new attack, the elves charged again with renewed numbers. Already many of the goblins were flying back down the river to escape from the trap, and many of their own wolves were turning upon them and rending the dead and the wounded. Victory seemed at hand when a cry rang out on the heights above. Thank you, Scott.
Goblins had scaled the mountain from the other side, and already many were on the slopes above the gate, and others were streaming down recklessly, heedless of those that fell screaming from cliff and precipice to attack the spurs from above. Each of these could be reached by paths that ran down from the main mass of the mountain in the center, and the defenders had too few to bar the way for long. Victory now vanished from hope. They had only stemmed the first onslaught of the black tide. Day drew on. The goblins gathered again in the valley. There a host of wargs came ravening, and with them came the bodyguard of Bolg. Goblins of huge size with scimitars of steel. Soon actual darkness was coming into a stormy sky, while still the great bats swirled above the heads and ears of the elves and men, or fastened vampire-like on the stricken. Now Bard was fighting to defend the eastern spur, and yet giving slowly back, and the elf lords were at bay about their king upon the southern arm, near to the watchpost on Raven Hill. Suddenly there was a great shout, and from the gate came a trumpet call. They had forgotten Thorin. Part of the wall, moved by levers, fell outward with a crash into the pool. Out leapt the king under the mountain, and his companions followed him. Hood and cloak were gone. They were in shining armor, and red light leapt from their eyes. In the gloom, the great dwarf gleamed like gold in a dying fire. Rocks were hurled down from on high by the goblins above, but they held on, leapt down to the fall's foot, and rushed forward to battle. Wolf and rider fell or fled before them. Thorin wielded his axe with mighty strokes, and nothing seemed to harm him. Wow, thank you. Hector. To me, to me. Elders and men, to me, all my kinsfolk, he cried and his voice shook like a horn in the valley. Down, heedless of order, rushed all the dwarves of Dain to his help. Down to, down to came many of the legmen, for Bard could not restrain them, and out upon the other side came many of the spearmen of the elves. Once again, the goblins were stricken in the valley, and they were piled in heaps, till the dale was dark and hideous with their, with their corpses. The works were scattering, and Thorin drove right against the bodyguard of Bolg, but he could not pierce the ranks. Already behind him, among the goblin dead, lay many men and many dwarves, and many a fair elf that should have lived yet long age merrily in the wood, and as the valley widened his onset, grew ever slower. His numbers were too few, his flanks were unguarded. Soon, soon the attackers were attacked, and they were forced into a great ring, facing every way, facing every way, him all about with goblins and wolves returning to the assault. The bodyguard of Bolg came howling against them and drove, and drove in upon the ranks like waves upon cliffs of sands. Their friends could not help them, for the assault from the mountain was renewed with redoubled force, and upon either side men and elves were being slowly beaten down. Thanks. Omar? On all these people look with misery. He had taken his stand on Raven Hill among the elves, part, partly because there was more chance of escape from that point, and partly with the more tookish part of his mind. Because if he was going to be in, in a last desperate stand, he preferred on the whole to defend the elven king. Gandalf to, I may, I may say, was there. You, uh, that did not seem so sitting on the ground as if in deep thought preparing, I suppose, some last blast of magic before the end. That did not seem far off. It will not be long now. 
of Hilo. Before the goblins win the gate, and we are all the slaughter on driving down and capture. Really, really, it is enough to make one weep. After all, one has gone through. I would rather all, all the smoke has been less with all the wretch treasure than that these wild, wild creatures should get it and poor old Bumble and Bailey and Philly and Killy and all the rest come to a bad end and bar two and the lake men and the merry elves. Misery me, I have heard some of many battles and I have always understood that defeat may be glorious. It seems very uncomfortable, not to say distressing. I wish I was well out of it. Thanks. Anayako, you finish. The clouds were torn by the wind and the red sunset slashed the west. Seeing the sudden gleam in the gloom, Bilbo looked around. He gave a great cry. He had seen a sight that made his hair leap. Dark shapes, shapes smell yet majestic against the distant glow. The eagles, the eagles, he shouted. The eagles are coming. Bilbo's eyes were seldom grown. The eagles were coming down the wind, line after line, in such a host as must have gathered from all the iris of the north. The eagles, the eagles, Bilbo cried, dancing and waving his arms. If the elves could not see him, they could hear him. Soon they too took up the cry and it echoed across the valley. Many wondering eyes looked up through as yet nothing could be seen except from the southern shoulder of the mountain. The eagles praised Bilbo once more, but at the moment a stone hurtling from above smote heavily on his helm, and he fell with a crash and knew no more. And he died. <laughs> I've got a couple of things I was going to bring up. I thought about this as we were going. Mm -hmm. This is this is something that uh, you don't really get if you're not reading it in English. And and uh, this, this is something that we talk about all the time. And I'm just going to reread a little portion of what we read earlier and listen to the alliteration of all the consonant sounds yeah. that we hit in a row in there's times when Tolkien does this on purpose. It's because of his mastery of English that he throws in a bunch of consonant sounds all in a row. So if you read this stuff out loud, even if you're reading by yourself, you read out loud and you notice he did that on purpose. So just listen to this. In the gloom, the great dwarf gleamed like gold in a dying fire. Rocks, and, rocks were hurled down from on high by the goblins above, but they held on, leapt down to the fall's foot, and rushed forward to battle. Wolf and rider fell or fled before them. Thorin wielded his axe in mighty strokes, and nothing seemed to harm him. So you hear like that, guh, 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 fu, 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 guh, guh, guh. It's, all, it's, it's really neat the way he's so good at doing that. And then something else that I wanted to read, because every time I'm talking to anyone about this section of the book, I always want to bring this up. And while you guys were reading, I actually brought up, since since uh, we one of our good friends, Corey, Corey Olson, the, the Tolkien professor, in his book, he discusses this section, and it's one of the most important things that links The Hobbit with the rest of the Legendarium. And I was just going to read a little section of this and let everybody hear it. Because I figure not there may not be everybody has read Corey Olson's uh, the his dissection of the Hobbit. So I'm gonna just read this, and if y'all y'all if y'all think it's too long, just stop me. But it doesn't take that long. So basically, we're talking about this exact moment. He says, of all the events in the tale that day, however. 
The greatest is the healing of Thorin Oakenshield. Poor Thorin was fenced in the dark and stinking mountain like a robber in his hold, blinded and consumed by the pride and greed that had led him to cast aside friendship, compassion, and finally even his own honor. In the midst of the battle, when the defenders are surrounded and all seems lost, Thorin throws down the stone wall that he has built and opens the gates of the king once more. Gold does indeed flow from the gate in the form of the king in shining armor, gleaming in the gloom like gold in a dying fire. To me, he cries, not only to his kinsfolk, but to the elves and men, whom he was calling thieves just hours before. The haughty dwarf, who seemed to care about nothing outside of himself, now throws himself into danger, leading the charge to save them and calling them to follow him. And they come. All the dwarves, of course, come rushing to their lord and kinsman, but many of the late men and many of the spearmen of the elves also run to his side, joining the last great charge of the king under the mountain. Now it would seem the old songs are really coming true. Whatever happens in this desperate attack, Thorin Oakenshield has been saved. Unfortunately, it appears that the day has not. Thorin's great charge stalls and the mountain is overrun by goblins. Victory now vanished from hope. Back in the tunnels under the Misty Mountains, Bilbo had been encouraged to think that he was connected to the old legends, finding that he had a sword from the fallen Gondolin itself. He now has a front row seat at the making of one of those legends, but he finds it very uncomfortable, not to say distressing. Defeat may be glorious in songs, but he doesn't think much of the prose version. Bilbo's look, however, doesn't quite fail him. The moment when Bilbo looks up and sees the eagles in the west is twice foreshadowed in The Hobbit. The narrator says, The clouds were torn by the wind, and a red sunset, sunset slashed the west. The tearing of the clouds around the lonely mountain by the wind is specifically stated in the Dwarves' Wind Song, in which racing clouds were torn and rent by the wind of destiny, which also guides the moon in its course and sets the stars aglow. The setting sun gleaming through the clouds also closely parallels the magical sun ray that reached through a bank of clouds in the west on Durin's day and pointed to the keyhole of the secret door, just as the moon letters foretold. The providence that has guided Bilbo and his companions and planned this soon-to-be legendary story is not quite done with them yet, it seems. The sudden rescue and happy ending that the eagles bring to the Battle of Five Armies is an iconic moment. Tolkien himself called this kind of sudden joyous turn near the end of a story a catastrophe, a good or happy catastrophe. In his great essay on fairy stories, Tolkien described this kind of event as a sudden and miraculous grace never be counted on, never to be counted on to recur. The unlooked for arrival of the eagles in the nick of time is the classic example of catastrophe in all of Tolkien's fiction. The battle as Bilbo sees it ends the battle, as, the battle as Bilbo sees it ends with an image that I think beautifully compares the spirit of catastrophe, the many wondering eyes of the beleaguered warriors in the valley looking up in sudden hope of deliverance, though as yet nothing could be seen. In the Battle of Five Armies, we see the final enactment of another theme that has recurred several times during the story, the striking tendency of apparent bad luck to turn out to be good luck. The Battle of Five Armies itself is the most extraordinary example of this pattern. A surprise assault by the assembled armies of all the goblins of the Misty Mountains and their warg allies would count as an enormous misfortune for anyone. In this instance, however, we cannot escape the fact that it was also a stroke of almost miraculous good luck. If the goblins had not appeared just when they did, blood would have been spilled between the dwarves of the mountain and the men of Dale. No matter what had happened in that fight, irreparable damage with far-reaching effects would have occurred. A victory by the goblins would have been preferable to that, for even if the allied peoples had gone down fighting the goblins together, the legacy of the battle would still be one of unity, and the survivors would still have had a shared enemy. In the big picture, the real battle was already won as soon as the elves, dwarves, and men started to fight on the same side rather than against each other. The onset of the Battle of Five Armies, terrible as it was, is actually a bigger and more important catastrophe than the intervention of the Eagles. It's so true. Okay, um, 
before we continue, let's take a picture so I can wrap it up and then we can continue talking. Do you have your books? I have my book. Wait. Uh, wait, let me put you on full screen. <laughs> I don't yes. have any books down here. All my books are on the uh, are on the computer and they're upstairs. Shame. Oh yeah, hold that up. That's much better. <laughs> okay, say dine. Dine. What does that mean? <laughs> because everybody pronounces it differently. And I was trying to look it up uh, and I wasn't sure. How do you pronounce the uh, um, Thorin's uh, cousin's name? I oh. say it's Dine. Uh, yeah, like I'm in the habit. I'm in the habit of saying Dan and <laughs> Nan and all that stuff. But the it should really be Dine. But it should be two syllables because the Tolkien kids made like a little nursery rhyme when yeah, they were yeah, young. Yeah, I was reading something about it. Yeah, and that little nursery rhyme gives away how you're supposed to pronounce all the names. They're not supposed to. It's wait, not wait, supposed wait, to be... wait, stop, stop, stop. I, I, I'm going to wrap it up so we can stop recording. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so you talk... I won't stop. I'll never stop. You, you know will that. never stop talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we know, we know. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us and be ready to continue reading next week. Thank you for being there and we'll finish the habit next week. See you there.